So I said, okay, this class will be interesting. Okay. <laughs> All right. It is good to know that you are excited. It is very, very good. Because we're going to be talking about World War I. So and it's very interesting, you know? So you Makes like the whole concept of World War One so far? Yes. All right, that is good. Now, ladies, today we are going to continue to look at World War One, right? It is. It was also called the Great War. What was another name for World War One? The Great War. The very good, the Great War, and. As a, I'm going to ask you now the question, why do you believe it was called World War I? Because or why do you think it was a great war? Because it was a global war. Global war, yes. Then how people from, uh, were if persons from the Caribbean involved in the war, people from this part, South America, Central America, uh, Africa, Australia, Europe. We know the war took place mainly in Europe, but did other persons like from other parts of the region got involved in the war? Because if it is a world war and everybody's involved in the war, then it must be, and, and if everything is, all the war is taking place here in Europe, then it could be a European war and not a great war, or it could be a, not a global war. It was just a European war, but why a world war? Why? If everything, if all the wars are taking place here, this is the battleground in Europe. This is the battleground where Europe is located. Why it is considered a world war? Because nobody's fighting here. Which country is located here? Look on the screen. Which country is here? Which country is above the United States? Sir, Canada. Canada, very good. Which country is here? Um, Central America. So we have Central America here, and Central America is divided into several different countries. Which country is located here? Jamaica. All right, very good. So Jamaica is located right here. And these are the flags of the Caribbean. Then, so this was how the world actually looked during the first 1914, because the war would have started in 1914. Anyone, why do you think it was called a world war? We, so we get one answer already, yes. The war was global, but how can we justify that the war was a global war? What happened? Sir, what in Go ahead, for me. Every country was involved. Every country was involved. Uh, Bruce, go ahead for me. Is that Dennis? Who is that? Okay. Dana? Yes, sir. Go ahead, so I was saying because um, all the countries are sort of connected. And like, if you're connected to one country, sir, that's in the war, you're going to be affected by the war also. Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Very good point. Very good point. And so during this time, in 1914, European countries such as Spain, su such as England, the Gre Great Britain, the United Kingdom, France, Spain, they would have owned 
and colonized most of the countries here in the Americas. And also they would have gone into Africa and take over some African countries. They would have gone in the Pacific and they would have taken over quite a lot of countries in the Pacific. Now, during this time, during the World War, and why it is considered Great War, is that all the colonies were also involved. So what is going to happen is that all the colonies in Africa, in the Pacific, in the Caribbean, all along here, they are going to send soldiers to Europe. They are going to send people to work in the war. They are going to send food and raw material in the war, for the war, to their different specific countries. And so because everybody was involved in the war, it was considered a world war. And it, or it was considered a great war because remember a lot of these countries here and in Africa, in South America, North America, Central America, the Caribbean, Africa, they always send goods to Europe. And so during the war, a lot of the goods that they usually send here are going to stop. And Europe used to send a lot of goods to the, these other parts of the world. And so though that trade is going to stop because everybody now is going to concentrate on what is taking place in Europe, the Great War. And so countries, if you look at other countries, this is a British flag here. And so this is England, which is located here. So England, well, England is made, made up of three, um, three different territories, four different territories. So you have England, which is here, then Wales, then Scotland and Ireland. So this makes up the United Kingdom. So there are four different kingdoms that join together to form the United Kingdom. So the UK, which is right here, the United Kingdom, they had a lot of colonies across the world. And anywhere you see this flag here, they are in charge of those countries. So if you go into Africa, they would have controlled this part of Africa, this part of Africa, this part of Africa, here, 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 right here. All of these areas in Africa, they would have controlled. If we go over to India, India was a colony of Britain. If we go down to the south, Australia. Australia was a colony of Britain. If we go over to the Caribbean, right here, Guyana was a colony of Britain. Trinidad is here. Most of these Caribbean islands here. Jamaica, colony of Britain. Belize, colony of Britain. And Canada was also a colony of Britain. So most of these countries that they are, which are actually colonies of Britain, they are going to send soldiers. So soldiers are coming, leaving from Canada to Britain to help in the war. Jamaica to Britain to help with the war. Uh, Guyana, which is what's called British Guyana to Britain to help with the war. British Honduras here, which is now called Belize, to Britain to help put the war. And I wonder when you plan to take me up. Repeat. And also Australia 
to help with the war. So anywhere you have British colonies, they are going to go to help with the war. Also, French people are going to get involved. So all the French colonies here, they are going to get involved. And different nations that were aligned to Spain are going to align uh, with their different Spanish territories or European territories. They are going to get involved in the war. Let us look at the United States. Who do you think the United States is going to assist in Europe in the war? Because by 1914, they would have received their independence. Go ahead. So would they help England? They would help England. Why do you think they would help England? Because they were once a colony of England. Very good. So because they were once colonies of, they were once a colony of, in, well, colonies, several different, 13 original colonies, they are going to also send soldiers, money, and all of these different goods to help England because had not, this had not of the other countries across the world, our colonies across the world went in to help their mother country, which is right in Europe, then dog would have eat their supper. So big things taking place. A great war is taking place here. The battleground is in Europe, but everybody is involved, and that's the reason why it was considered a world war or a great war. All right, ladies. Yes, sir. Good, good. Now, I am going to allow you to watch a, it's not a short movie. Well, it's a documentary-like movie about what was taking place in Europe during this time. I'm not even sure if, it, if we're going to be able to watch all of it. But I'm giving you the context of the Great War. So when you watch the movie, I want you to pick out the causes. So while you're watching the movie, you're going to write in your notebook causes. And as you go through the movie, listen to the documentary. I think it is a documentary. As you go through the documentary, Think about, listen to all the different reasons. So you're going to have on one page reasons for the war, effects. What are the things taking place? What are the effects? And so when we meet again, we are going to have a discussion on this documentary. So I am taking notes. I already, I already watched it already. I know my notes. But I'm going to still take notes. I want you to take notes also. All right, ladies? OK, sir. of the 7th East Surrey Regiment. On the 5th of October 1915, my great-uncle, Lieutenant Aubrey Hastings of the 7th East Surrey Regiment, was killed in France, blown to pieces in his trench during the Battle of Luz. I grew up with his story, reading the unhappy letters that he wrote amid the poppies of the battlefield, along with those of a grandfather and another great uncle who survived. But this is the first time I've visited the cemetery at fouquier le bethune where Aubrey's buried, one of some 900,000 British Empire dead of the First World War. Almost everyone in this country 
shares such links with that catastrophe for our forefathers and for Europe. It's a funny business looking down at the last resting place of one of my own family whom I never met, who died in a struggle that I've spent decades reading about. Its horror is not in doubt. But where I part company from what we might call the Blackadder take on history is to believe that it was also futile, that it didn't matter which side won. In the 21st century, the British people are deeply wedded to the idea that the Second World War was our good war, the first our bad one. But what if we'd stayed out? What if Germany had won? In my opinion, the deaths of Aubrey Hastings and hundreds of thousands of his comrades were assuredly a great tragedy, but they were not for nothing. Many British people honour the men who fought and died with a mixture of sorrow and a sense of waste. A belief that no cause could have justified so horrendous a sacrifice. But a hundred years after the outbreak, it seems time to revisit the reasons we went to war in 1914. I want to argue that far from Britain having plunged into a bloodbath we could have stayed out of, our part in the First World War was tragically necessary. Any exploration of why Britain had to go to war in 1914 must start on the continent of Europe. The spark was ignited in the Balkans on the 28th of June when Gavrilo Princip, a Bosnian Serb, shot dead Archduke Franz Ferdinand, heir to the Austrian throne. The Empire's rulers immediately determined to exploit the outrage to justify invading neighbouring Serbia, where the murder weapons had come from. But the Russians were Serbia's close allies, and they made it plain they would fight to protect their fellow Slavs. Through July 1914, the great continental powers waded ever deeper into crisis. But from the outset, the key player was Germany. On the 6th of July, its rulers pledged the Austrians their unconditional support to smash Serbia, promising to deal with Russia and its own ally France if they intervened. Day by day, it became plainer that none of the big players would back down. And thus began the countdown to the First World War. Some historians have argued that once it became clear that Austria and Germany were going to war with France and Russia, we, the British, should simply have left them to get on with it, stayed out. But all that would have come out of a German victory was a fast-forwarded version of today's European Union. I don't buy that. The people who are running Germany cared nothing for democracy or other people's freedoms. Once the shooting started, it became plain that their war aims were little different from those of Hitler 35 years later, excepting only the Jewish genocide. The causes of the war are hugely complicated, with the death of the Archduke only setting in motion existing forces. No one nation deserves all the blame. But there's an overriding case that German recklessness contributed more than anything else to make a conflict intended to settle a local score escalate into a European war. And once the fighting and dying started, it became cruelly apparent that a German victory would be a disaster for Europe. In 1914, Germany was by far the most powerful state on the continent, the most advanced society in Europe. In 
Industrially, it was racing ahead of its rivals in every field from pharmaceuticals to automobile design. Socially, it pioneered a welfare state by creating unemployment insurance and old age pensions. German culture was revered across the world. But it became Europe's historic tragedy that the German system of government lagged generations behind everything else in the country. The empire's elected parliament had the largest socialist party in Europe. But while the Reichstag dominated domestic affairs, it was the Kaiser, the so-called All-Highest, Wilhelm II, who still made every key appointment and controlled decisions about war and peace. Wilhelm was a weak man who was sought to masquerade as a strong one, chronically unstable and prone to violent mood swings. He wasn't at heart a warmonger, as of course Hitler was, but he loved to play at soldiers. He offered threats and blandishments to other powers, which he always got in the wrong order. <music> Professor John Rowell has spent a lifetime studying and writing about the Kaiser. How personally influential was Kaiser Wilhelm? in the decision for war? Uh, Kaiser Wilhelm took over the reins from uh, his father in 1888 and inherited Bismarck's immense power himself when he threw Bismarck out, but not content with that. He then went back to an almost 18th century notion of monarchy. In other words, he insisted on ruling personally. Uh, with the result, he appointed all ministers, all the chancellors, all the generals, all the admirals himself personally, according to his likes and dislikes. He was an extremely assertive bully. Well, it was just an extraordinary situation that you had a socialist majority, violently anti-militarist majority in the Reichstag, and yet exercising no influence at all, really, over um, this regime and foreign policy. Yeah. Uh, one of the reasons, I believe, uh, behind the German general's decision to go to war around about 1914 was the rising tide of democracy at home. The, the thinking was, well, if we leave it too long, we will not be able to get our way and do what we really need to do to make Germany great. So we better go uh, before that time comes. The most powerful institution in Wilhelm's empire, and indeed in all continental Europe, was the German army. The Kaiser was also eager to extend his power across the seas and personally promoted the creation of a big gun navy. This thoroughly alarmed the British, who feared Germany's fleet as a threat to their global trade routes and empire. As Queen Victoria's grandson, Wilhelm retained some respect for her people, but he was determined that neither he nor his empire should defer to them. It's almost as if he feels obliged to be more military and more masculine than any other monarch, perhaps because there's always the whiff of Englishness about him, his mother being English. He was always very keen to say, no, no, I'm not English, I'm Prussian. I'm, I'm extremely Prussian. So there's this autocratic uh, side to him, there's extreme militarism, but some of it does come from England. So, for example, the love of the Navy, the idea that he has a mission to become the superpower in Europe in place of Britain. He feels he has a right as leader of this new, energised Germany after unification. Fear of Germany's might and of its aspirations to dominate Europe prompted Russia and France to forge a close military alliance. Although Britain's government made no firm written commitment, it posted an option on supporting them in the event of war. Many British people recoiled from the idea of joining an alliance with Tsar Nicholas II, whose people had been Britain's enemies through the 19th century. But the fears of Europe's rulers that a general war would result from their rivalries caused every nation to huddle close to its friends. The Germans to the Austrians, the Russians to the French, with the British as cautious maybes. 
Germany's warlords were haunted by fears of Russia's growing might. Some of them were convinced that challenging the Tsar's armies sooner rather than later offered Germany the best chance of victory. This is one of many German memorials to Prussia's 19th century military triumphs. Instead of perceiving big wars, as we do today, as universal tragedies, the Kaiser's generals, and sometimes Wilhelm himself, believed that trial by battle was an acceptable instrument of policy. All Germany's leaders were insecure, even paranoid, about threats at home from the socialists, abroad from Russia and France, probably backed in a showdown by Britain. In those days, not many people thought seriously about economics. The Kaiser and his generals counted soldiers. They failed to realize that their country was achieving dominance of Europe without firing a shot through its industrial power. By 1914, so many Germans had come to believe that a European clash in arms was inevitable, that their fatalism contributed mightily to bringing this about. The Kaiser, who was almost certainly clinically unstable, was one of three men in Germany who took the key decisions which resulted in war. To this day, historians argue fiercely about which pulled the levers to precipitate disaster. The others were the Chancellor, Theobald von Bethmann Holweg, appointed by Wilhelm, and General Helmut von Moltke, head of the army. The Kaiser and the Chancellor were the ones who, on the 6th of July, promised Austria Germany's support against Serbia. Bethmann Holweg, knowing that Russia was committed to protect the Serbs, pressed the Austrians to hurry their invasion to preempt the Tsar. This has become known as Berlin's blank check. Keystone of the argument that Germany was most blameworthy for the horrors that followed. Professor Sir Hugh Strawn has been studying and chronicling the war for over 30 years. He agrees that Berlin took a huge gamble. The Germans actively encouraged the Austrians not merely to invade Serbia, but to get on and do it even more quickly than they were ready to do it. Yes, partly because I think if they do it quickly, you'll get away with it. You'll be able to crush Serbia. There'll be a Balkan war that is over so quick that nobody will have time to intervene. So the, the, the presumption here is speed. And what Berlin is doing is constantly taking best case advice. You know, will Russia stay out of this war because they're worried there'll be a revolution in Russia? The best answer is that, yes, they will, because there has been a revolution in Russia in 1905, and there might be again. So they work with that assumption. Whereas, in fact, of course, the Tsar's going to be put under tremendous pressure to back the South Slavs in Serbia. But throughout July, the one nation, surely, that had the power to stop this process, if the Germans had said to the Austrians, stop, do not invade Serbia, there would have not been a general European war, would there? That's right. I think they have the power to say no. I mean, after all, the blank check is central, and, and the blank check is issued by Germany. And Germany then seems to show remarkable insouciance as to how that check will be used. You know, Austria-Hungary still has to cash it. It's Austria-Hungary that has to initiate war. But absolutely, the balance then shifts to Berlin and if any power has the capacity to stop it, it's Berlin, particularly at the very end of the crisis. Army Chief of Staff Helmut von Moltke, who answered only to the Kaiser, also played a pivotal role. On the 28th of July, Wilhelm and Bethmann Holweg experienced a brief panic attack. The looming war now looked far bigger and graver than they'd bargained for. But Moltke, on his own initiative, telegraphed the Austrians and urged them to hasten their attack. The Chief of Staff had long argued that if Germany must face a European showdown, it was better to have it before the Russians' big armaments expansion program was complete. At an Imperial Council meeting in December 1912, he's reliably reported as saying, war, and the sooner the better. Annika Mombauer is a German scholar who's written a biography of the Chief of Staff which emphasizes his role in the July crisis. Where did Moltke fit into the decision for war? 
Well, Moltke very much advocates war. He thinks that war is inevitable in the long run. Uh, he thinks that eventually Russia will become too strong, too militarily powerful for Germany to defeat her. And therefore, he uh, creates an atmosphere in which war seems a good solution out of a perceived problem. One thing that seems extraordinary to us about how dysfunctional the German government was in July 1914 is that here you've got Moltke, who's supposed to be just the head of the army. And at a critical moment, July the 28th, he sends a telegram to Vienna, to the Austrians, telling them to get on with invading Serbia. And it does seem an extraordinary reflection of both how reckless Moltke could be and of how powerful he was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you're right. He, he does send that telegram. And in Vienna, they end up saying, well, who actually... Who rules in who Berlin? Who rules in Berlin? <laughs> Moltke or Bethmann? Or was it, in fact, the Kaiser? Um, so, yes, you're completely right. He exceeds his authority, if you like, by sending this telegram. Germany's leadership in July 1914 was extraordinarily reckless in accepting the risk that by promoting a small Balkan war, they would trigger a huge European one. When it became plain that the Russians would fight rather than see Serbia go under, the Germans refused to take the one step that could have prevented a general European catastrophe, telling the Austrians to pull back. Instead, they themselves prepared to mobilize against Russia. And that's why I believe they deserve most blame for all that followed. On the 28th of July, Austria declared war on Serbia, and two days later, the Tsar ordered his army to mobilize. Germany then issued two ultimatums, one to Russia and another to France, its ally. Neither was expected to accept, and few of the Kaiser's generals wished them to. Berlin then set in motion its hugely ambitious war plan, designed to crush France before turning on Russia. Created almost a decade earlier by Moltke's predecessor, Count Alfred von Schlieffen, the plan required an invasion of France by way of its back door, through neutral Belgium. It was the German commitment to overrun Belgium which suddenly propelled Britain, hitherto a mere spectator of the continental drama, to the forefront of the stage. Under a treaty signed in 1839, this country was among the guarantors of Belgian neutrality. I'm one of those who still wonder whether Britain really would have come in mm -hmm. if it hadn't been for the invasion of Belgium. Molka got this dead wrong, didn't he? He did. He did. He was in an impossible situation, militarily speaking, or strategically speaking, because Germany is, in a sense, encircled by France in the West and Russia in the East. And the only way he thinks he can win this war is by implementing the so-called Schlieffen plan. And that plan can only work if France is defeated quickly, and that means invading Belgium. But interestingly, in France, the chief of staff similarly thinks our best chance would be to advance through Belgium, but the politicians, the, the, the diplomats, tell him we can't do that because of Britain. Well, the British told France exactly. on no account going exactly. to Belgium. Exactly, exactly. And so had Germany also respected Belgian neutrality, there would have been all sorts of possibilities right at the end of July and early in August, perhaps to come to a different outcome. Thus, in the first days of August 1914, Germany prepared to invade and crush France in a campaign of 40 days before turning on Russia. Europe had a war, but must the British be in it? Would they fight? Basking in the balmy summer of 1914 and preoccupied by industrial turmoil and threatened Irish civil war, the British people had scant appetite for a continental conflict. But Liberal Prime Minister Herbert Asquith and several key cabinet colleagues were appalled by the prospect of Germany achieving dominance of Europe. They doubted that Britain could merely remain a bystander while this happened. One such was the Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Grey, 
who played a critical role. Sir Edward Grey is traditionally seen as a reticent English gentleman whose grand passions were fly fishing and bird watching, both of which he wrote good books about. But more recently, he's become a focus of fierce controversy. Some historians claim that Grey made rash, secret commitments to the French, which dragged us unnecessarily into war. For centuries, it had been a British article of faith that a balance of power, which denied absolute dominance to any one nation, must be maintained on the continent. Between 1908 and 1914, when Grey was not casting a fly on bright waters, he held secret talks with the French about British support in the event of a German attack. The Foreign Secretary was less clever and less of a statesman than his admirers thought. But the claim that he should be damned for dragging Britain into an unnecessary war doesn't stand up. I suggest that Grey was a realist about the difficulty, indeed impossibility, of Britain simply standing by doing nothing while Germany conquered Europe. If the French and Russians had been beaten, as they almost certainly would have been if Britain hadn't come in, who can imagine a victorious Germany allowing Britain to continue ruling the waves and the world's financial system any more than Hitler would have done if Churchill had tried to strike a deal with him in 1940. Nothing Grey said beforehand could have deterred the Germans because they had weighed Britain's military power and discounted it. The little British army seemed incapable of influencing a huge clash of continental hosts. The Royal Navy was thought irrelevant because, in the Kaiser's scornful words, dreadnoughts have no wheels. The Foreign Secretary's secret and unwritten assurances to France seem to me to have reflected not warmongering but prudent and essential precaution. In July 1914, by proposing an immediate European conference, Grey did all that he could to avert war. Sir Michael Howard is Britain's most distinguished living historian. He and I have spent many hours discussing the vast puzzle of 1914 and, crucially, whether Britain could have done more to avert disaster. Gray's proposal, which they rejected out of hand to address the confrontation between Austria-Hungary and Serbia by having a peace conference, it wasn't a contemptible proposal, was it? If no, they wanted a no, diplomatic it was, outcome. I mean, it was absolutely typical, for the typical Gray thing to do, a typical sort of liberal solution. Uh, and uh, well, the it, Germans rejected it flatly. The Germans rejected it flatly because this would have meant letting down the Austrians and they were not going to let down the Austrians. There was this sense throughout all classes in Austria, it is time to finish with the Serbs. If we don't finish with the Serbs, they will nibble us to death. This is the moment to strike. The Germans, knowing, knowing this was the case, were not going to bring in the Austrians to debate about what their future was going to be. Um, so to that extent also, you could say that the, the Germans were responsible for not, not letting there be a peaceful settlement. On the 2nd of August, the Germans issued an ultimatum to King Albert of Belgium, demanding passage for their armies. He flatly refused and appealed to Britain as a guarantor of his country's neutrality. Thus, it fell to Sir Edward Grey to convince a still reluctant British Parliament of the necessity for Britain to join the war on the continent. On the afternoon of the 3rd of August, Grey delivered the most important speech of his life to the House of Commons. By now, most of the Cabinet believed that Britain must fight in the name of Belgium's rights. Could this country, Grey demanded, stand by and watch the direst crime that ever stained human history and thus become participators in the sin? He added, we should I believe, sacrifice our respect and good name before the world and should not escape the most serious and grave consequences. 
This was one of those extraordinary parliamentary occasions that changed history. It persuaded much of the Liberal Party, hitherto bitterly hostile to intervention, now to support it, as the Conservative opposition already did. Thus, on the 4th of August 1914, after Berlin rejected an ultimatum demanding its withdrawal from Belgium, Britain declared war on Germany. Was Belgium the real reason that Britain went to war in 1914, or as some historians nowadays try to argue, oh, it was just a pretext that the British government really wanted to fight anyway? Yeah. Well, I would tend to say it's both and. It's, it, 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 there, there, are two, there are two arguments here. One is the security of Belgium and the absence of a dominant power on the mainland of Europe is seen as central to Britain's strategic position. There can't be the equivalent of Napoleon facing Britain across the Channel and dominating Britain's routes to the rest of the world. The second issue is... Does it matter that Germany disregards its international obligations, enters Belgium, which is a neutral state, um, and fails to reflect both international law and the rights of, 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 of small nations? And the answer is it does matter. And it, do, it matters because, for Britain, international law and what we might now see as morality also matters. But it's more fundamental than that. Because Britain is, is an economic uh, power, a trading power, a power that depends on its shipping, Actually, international law is more than just a sense of, of, of legal and moral obligation. It's also a matter of economic necessity. You need to respect international law to make sure that Britain can continue to exercise the degree of leverage it does as a neutral itself. Well, some people say now, oh, it was incredibly silly for Britain to get involved in this horrific experience, the First World War, just because the German army marched into Belgium. But actually, it seems to me, it was a pretty good reason for going to war. It was an excellent reason for going to war, and it did something which, at the beginning of the July crisis, seemed unimaginable to many. It united which is, the British people. It united the British people. It united the cabinet and it united the people. As Britain mobilised its little army in that first week of August, Germany's vast host was already surging into Belgium. Within days, the first reports appeared in the world's newspapers describing the extraordinarily brutal conduct of German troops towards the Belgian people. They were not merely carelessly destroying homes and villages. All invading armies do that. They were seizing and killing civilian hostages in scores and hundreds. Even before 1914, the Kaiser's army had earned a reputation for exceptional brutality. Between 1904 and 7, when the Herero and Nama tribes rebelled against German colonial rule in southwest Africa, the Kaiser's soldiers killed or deliberately starved to death almost 100,000 native people. Wilhelm applauded and decorated the officer responsible. Even by the imperial standards of the day, this action was worse than any British excess. But the Herero genocide had been far away in Africa. In August 1914, world opinion was stunned by German savagery towards fellow Europeans. In Flanders, the destruction of the medieval university town of Louvain, today rebuilt from ashes, became a symbol of the excesses of the Kaiser's soldiers endorsed by Berlin. Professor John Horn has exhaustively researched and catalogued the German army's actions in Berlin and France during 1914. John, we're here in the university library at Louvain, what happened here? Well, on the 25th of um, August, there was the sound of fighting, German soldiers shooting at what they claimed was a civilian insurrection. Round about 11 o'clock in the evening, this beautiful university library was broken into by the German soldiers and deliberately set fire. One young Jesuit, Father Duperieux, 
uh, had written in his notebook that he thought the Germans in burning down the library had done something as barbaric as the destruction of the Library of Alexandria in antiquity. This was seized by German soldiers and he was summarily executed. And by the 29th or the 30th, you have to imagine Louvain um, as an almost empty town. The population that hadn't been deported gradually straggled back in to find between 1,500 and 2,000 buildings destroyed and well over 240 of their own townspeople had been killed. All armies in all wars can behave very badly. What seems different about what happened in Belgium in 1914 was that it wasn't just a question of, of the odd soldiers um, brutally murdering a few civilians. They were systematically shooting them in scores and sometimes in hundreds as hostages. You're quite right. But what we've just described in Louvain was a terrible incident and it immediately grabbed the international headlines. But it was typical of... All right, ladies, our time has expired. So I'm going to put the rest of the link in the Google Classroom, and I want you to continue to watch it for your homework and continue to look at the causes, right? The causes and the effects. So when we meet again next Friday, we can have a discussion on the causes of the the Great World War. It is? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. Enjoy the rest of the day. Enjoy your week, sir. Enjoy your week. 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 Enjoy your week.